Yes, thank you. Yes, indeed. We are looking at the blooming proof of creation uh, because there's plenty of it. And because John is not here, I'm going to talk about some of the things that John has grown in his garden because if he was here, he would like to share them with us. And John likes to grow weird plants. Mm -hmm. And I mean really weird plants, bizarre blooms. Um, these are orchid plants uh, that do all sorts of strange things like shooting and drugs and kidnapping. And uh, so we will get to some pretty flowers later on. But uh, while, while John's not here, let's uh, have a look at some of these bizarre blooms. Now, this is um, a, an, an orchid called a catacetum. And this is an interesting plant in that it has separate male and female plants. And this is the male plant, so it produces pollen. Now, it's a bit hard to see where the pollen is in this photo, uh, but if you have a look at it from sort of up the nose, as it were, you can see that the pollen is there uh, underneath that sort of hood. But below that, you can see there is a spike that's sticking out, and that's actually a trigger. And so... Uh, an insect, in, uh, uh, in this case a bee, will fly into this flower and you can see there's a, a curved um, hollow place where the bee can land, but it doesn't take much movement before it actually triggers that, uh, that little spike there and the flower literally shoots the bee with quite a deal of force. And on the pollen, there is a blob of glue and the glue sticks the, the pollen onto the back of the bee. Now, uh, that's a, and it's quite forceful, actually. Now, that obviously sort of um, makes the bee feel quite uncomfortable. So these things are a bit wary about coming back to another flower that's like that. Um, <clears throat> but the, the plant has a, a way around that. As I said, it has male flowers and female flowers. And the female flowers are quite different. They look very different to the male flower. So a bee will fly into that. And if it has pollen on its back, the pollen actually sticks up. And inside the hollow space in this flower, there is a little groove, which is just the right size for grabbing hold of that pollen and ripping it off the, the bee's back. So the bee gets shot and then it gets ripped off. Uh, not a very pet friendly plant but very interesting plant and a brilliant piece of design because if you think about that, how would that evolve step by step for a start? You've got to have both the male and the female flowers with exactly the right design and exactly the right mm. shape and size for this to work. And it's all got to work in one generation. You only get one generation to get this right. Otherwise, this whole plant, both male and female, would be extinct. Now, here's another weird looking plant. Uh, this is not the most prepossessing plant that you could ever go wandering around. I mean, if someone gave you a bunch of these and said, here are some flowers that remind me of you, uh, I don't know that you'd be impressed. Although if you could smell the flowers, you might be impressed. They have the most amazing, strong, sweet smell. In fact, I remember many years ago, uh, we got uh, a film producer to come and film some of these because one day we would like to make a whole video about orchids and all the brilliant and amazing design that's in them and all the beauty. And so when this plant was blooming, uh, we got our video producer friend to come over and film this plant and we didn't want it to get damaged overnight. So we put it inside so that it would be protected. But a couple of hours later, we all looked at one another and said, no, that plant has got to go back outside. <laughs> the fragrance is just so strong and so powerful. And that's an important part of the way this plant works. Now, it is a really odd looking plant. I mean, one of the odd looking things about it is that it flowers through its roots. That's weird enough. But look at the complex three dimensional shape. It really is very strange. And the other interesting thing is whereabouts its pollen is. It's not in the middle of the flower. It's right at the bottom of that long curved column 
that uh, projects over one side and the pollen is right there at the bottom. Now, in order for a bee to pick up this pollen, it has to land in the middle of the flower, but that's a long way from the pollen. But again, the plant has ways and means of making sure that the bee picks up the pollen because in that hollow place there where the bee can land, there isn't any nectar. Most flowers produce nectar. That's, the, that's what bees are encouraged to come and land on flowers for. This plant produces fragrant oils. And so the bee is attracted by this very strong fragrance and it will actually deliberately collect the fragrant oils. And it's so powerful, this scent, that eventually the bee will just absorb the fragrant oils. It's got a little furry part on its legs where it will collect the fragrant oil. And it just sort of goes, ah, and it literally falls through the flower. So it's a bit like this. The bee comes in and it will gather the perfume. And the really interesting thing is the bee gathers this perfume and then uses that to attract a female bee. So it goes to the perfume shop, as it were, gathers some perfume and uh, its legs have these sort of little brushes that are designed to pick up these fragrant oils and it just gets so overwhelmed it literally falls through the flower and gathers the pollen on its way. It's just the right size for the pollen to stick to its back. Very weird. But then it's only done half the job. It's then got to go to another flower and it will get the same treatment. Now apparently gathering perfume and falling through the flower isn't quite as bad as being shot. So <laughs> this plant does actually collect pollen with the same blooms. It doesn't have male and female blooms. And so on the end of the one of those columns where the pollen used to be uh, for the plant, for the bee to collect, uh, after the bee has collected it, behind that there are these two little pouches and so if a bee that is loaded with pollen as it were falls through the flower the the pollen will get collected in that those two little pouches and that will fertilize the flower really truly amazing design and again you have to get this all right within one generation you can't evolve it step by step now here's an here's another plant now, this one doesn't shoot things or, uh, or drug them with the overwhelming perfume. This one captures them and kidnaps them, but it does eventually let them go. Now, this is a green hood orchid. It's actually a very, very tiny, weeny little orchid, and it's fertilized by mosquitoes. So if you've ever wondered why the Lord made mosquitoes, the answer is not to bite you. Uh, in fact, male mosquitoes don't bite. Female mosquitoes do bite, but only when they need uh, iron and protein to, to lay eggs. Most of the time, mosquitoes live on plant juices and plant nectar. So this particular little orchid is attractive to mosquitoes. So a mosquito will fly in, and the only place it can land properly is on that little lip or that little tongue that's sticking out uh, just above the, the V-shaped uh, area in the middle of the flower there. And when it does that, this is so well balanced that that will fall backwards and throw the mosquito into the middle of the flower. And this was um, <clears throat> an observation that, that John Mackay very carefully sat down and watched that and took these photos. So I can't take any credit for these photos. John Mackay took them uh, and did this research. It's just he's not here tonight. So that's why I'm showing them to you. And uh, you can see that that uh, that sort of lever shaped um, tongue there has flipped back, flipped the mosquito into the bottom of the flower. And at the bottom of the flower, there is some nectar. So the little mosquito will crawl around there, get a good drink of mosquito, but then how is it going to get out of the flower? Well, in fact, the only way it can get out of the flower is to crawl up the back there. And most of the sides of this flower are quite slippery, but there is a track where 
it's not slippery so the mosquito can actually crawl up the back and it has to go through um, that cylindrical part right at the top of the flower and you can see just a little yellow knob there at the top that is the pollen of the flower so the mosquito will crawl up the back there where there's a path that has a sort of matte finish rather than a, a, a shiny slippery finish and it will go through that tunnel and it will collect the pollen on its way out and fly away. Now the pot and the uh, flower will then reset itself because again the mosquito has only done half the job. The flower has only done half the job of giving away its pollen. It has to collect some pollen as well in order for the flower to be fertilized and uh, when another mosquito comes along this time carrying pollen the uh, flower will collect the pollen which will then go down into the stem underneath and you can see there's an expanded area down there that's where the ovary of the plant is and that will be fertilized and produce seed for the next generation which will produce more of these after their kind really brilliant system However, John doesn't only breed weird plants. He does actually breed some very beautiful plants, so we won't pour scorn on his weird plants. Uh, here are some other plants from John's garden. Aren't they lovely? Absolutely beautiful. Um, and you can come and see some of these at our Jurassic Ark site as well. Really glorious um, pieces of God's creation that are just a delight to the eyes. Um, really does your heart good to come along and, and see these. And uh, the interesting thing is, see how a lot of these have tree bark in the background. These are what are called epiphytes. Um, they're not parasites. They live on trees, but they don't actually take anything from them. They just use the trees as a sort of structure. And uh, I've always wondered how the evolutionist um, worked out that uh, the first flowering plant supposedly grew in the ground um, with roots, just like most flowering plants. What, is, what was it that made orchids decide to climb trees and live on those? No, they were designed as epiphytes and they are brilliantly designed to live uh, on, on trees but without doing any damage to them and just add that extra piece of beauty to uh, already lovely trees. And uh, But I do like beautiful blooms and they're not only beautiful to look at, they also offer some other things. Now, we've all already looked at one particularly fragrant orchid, um, but there are also other fragrances and uh, interesting things that plants offer besides uh, beauty. And I love to grow sweet peas, and they are a very fragrant flower. I, uh, In a place I used to live, I used to grow sweet peas next to a little path that went past the front of my place and I loved watching people walk along this path and they'd slow down and take a few deep breaths when the sweet pea season was on because they were just so lovely. Now the skeptics will say that oh well flowers just produce scents, lovely perfumes and have beautiful colours in order to attract insects. That's true, they do. Um, but sweet peas are really interesting. Now, can you see any pollen in these, uh, in these flowers? Uh, and one day I was watching some bees flying around, um, not in my garden, but in somebody else's garden, and a bee landed on, a, on one of these flowers. And you can almost see the frustration in its face. I've landed on this beautiful, fragrant flower, but I can't find any pollen. And that is because the pollen is completely enclosed in these little chambers here. And these flowers are self-fertile. They'll fertilize themselves. They don't need insects, but they do have color and they do have fragrance and they are really beautiful and attractive. So why did God make sweet peas? Well, because they're pretty. <laughs> I'm sure there are other reasons as well. But, uh, but yeah, beauty is important. Um, and uh, there you can see I've opened the uh, that enclosed chamber and you can see the pollen in these flowers. So they do have pollen 
and they do have a pollen receiving stigma, but they are self fertile. And uh, you, you can just leave them alone and they will fertilize themselves and you'll get more sweet peas. Now, I love water lilies and some of those are fragrant as well. And, but I just love the, the beautiful symmetry and the, uh, the artistic colors that you get in them. And I'm sure God really enjoyed making water lilies. They are so beautiful that he's floated them on water and you get to see them twice, which is really nice. But water lilies also have another interesting property. They are literally floral furnaces. Underneath the flower, they will burn starch and that produces heat. So they are warm flowers and that is a good thing. Why would you want to be a warm flower when you float in the middle of a pond? Well, that is because flowers have to be fertilized by, uh, these flowers do have to be fertilized by insects. They're not self fertile. And uh, so we had a look at some of these and you can see some really tiny, weeny little bees. These are little native bees. Um, they do produce honey, but uh, not a lot. They are really tiny little bees. You can see how tiny they are and they do produce pollen. You can see um, uh, one of them there has produced some, uh, has, sorry, not produced pollen, they collect pollen. Uh, and just like uh, honeybees do when they actually have pollen baskets on their on their legs. But for a, a tiny little insect to fly over water, they can very easily lose heat. But if they land in a nice warm flower, they can sit there and get warmed up again because they then have to fly back over the water to another flower in order to do the, uh, the work of fertilization. So at Creation Research, we like to observe things and measure things. So we decided we'd have a look at um, how well the uh, water lilies heat their flowers. So here are a few temperature measurements. Now, this is uh, a lovely warm day in Queensland. It's 26.2 degrees just out in the air. And in John's Pond, uh, the temperature goes down to 19.7, which is uh, not a bad temperature to swim in, but for a tiny little insect, that is enough where it would lose heat. But in the flower, look at the temperature there, <laughs> 32.8. So the flower is 12 degrees hotter. Uh, sorry, um, <clears throat> what's tw uh, 32 minus um, 19? It's a little bit more than that, isn't it? Okay, compared with the water around it. That is a very effective floral furnace and it's giving the uh, tiny little native bees and, and any other insects that happen to fly into it uh, a very warm welcome. Uh, these flowers are not unique in producing heat. There are quite a few other flowers that will do this uh, in order to give their pollinators a little bit of an extra energy boost. Here is one of them, but this one doesn't um, burn starch to produce heat. Uh, anyone recognize these? These are snapdragons or antirhinums, and they are a very interesting flower as well because they have solar heating. If you look at the surface of these, you can see it has a sort of slightly furry matte finish, and that is because the petals aren't smooth and completely shiny. If you look at these under a microscope, the petals are covered with these sort of cone-shaped projections, and these will absorb heat from the sun. So these are solar heated um, flowers. Uh, and this is uh, an illustration from uh, a number of scientific papers who have been written about this, and some scientists deliberately bred a mutant flower that didn't produce these cones, so it has these flat cells, and then looked at the properties of the uh, wild-type plant, that's the plant with the, uh, the cone-shaped cells and the flat ones, to see if it made a difference to how well this plant lives, how well it can be pollinated. And it does make a difference. Now, this is another flower whose pollen is hidden, but it doesn't fertilize itself. It does need uh, an insect to come along and literally 
pry it apart. So the bees are attracted to this flower and they will push their way into it. There is pollen at the base of that flower and nectar. And in order to get a good grip on this flower, all those cone-shaped, um, that cone-shaped matte surface actually does help the bees get a good grip. And so the scientists have actually tested the uh, flowers with the normal cone-shaped cells on their petals and the flat ones. And they have found it's enough to make a difference as to whether the bees can get a good grip on the flowers and also whether they can enjoy the solar heating. Now, I once listened to an interview with one of the botanists who was studying these flowers, and uh, she made this uh, comment at the end of her interview. The implication that we're really most excited about is that flowers are cleverer than we thought they were. Now, I don't think that is a particularly clever statement, actually, because what this person was observing was the work of a clever creator. So that is not such a clever statement. And um, there is a verse in the Bible that reminds us that people who ignore the evidence of creation, well, they call themselves wise, but uh, really they have become fools. And how sad that is when they are studying these wondrous and brilliant designs of the creator, but not coming to know the creator as a person. And uh, this is not just a frivolous sort of uh, thing to study flowers, much as I love looking at them, love photographing them, but it is important to remember that nearly all the plant foods that we eat come from flowering plants. I can only think of a couple of non-flowering plants that, that we eat. One would be seaweed, of course, uh, and pine nuts would be another one because conifers uh, do produce pollen, but they, they, they don't have flowers. But you think of all of the fruits, nuts, seeds, uh, all the grains that we eat, all of those are flowering plants. And we are told in Genesis that the Lord God made to spring up in the Garden of Eden, particularly every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, and that applies to all of the other plants that he made. And remember, there are those two aspects which obviously meant something to God because when God had finished the creation, he declared it to be very good. So it is important that the plants are pleasing to the sight. That is good for our soul. That's good for us. And they are also good for food. 